for Women's History Month, we have uh, Director of Mission Services. So what you may have seen before for Janice Glover Jones, I'm correcting her title, Offices of the General and Training and Education. So happy to have you here with us today. I'd also like to introduce Colonel Ma Rachel McCaffrey. She's the Vice President of Membership and Chapter Association and the Executive Director of Women in Defense based in Arlington, Virginia, NDIA is a nonprofit educational association representing in this. I'd like to introduce you to the host of the speaker series today, which is Ensign National Security Innovation Network. I am Karen Frey, and I am the National Service Portfolio Director. Ensign is um, it's a government program office, and our mission is to build networks of program innovators um, that generate new solutions to national security problems. So uh, welcome to our guests. And first of all, uh, I'd like to kick off with um, just some questions to um, our, our, our two guests here. But first, I will give you both to um, just start off with a few opening words. So Rachel, I'll, I'll just start with you. It is Women's History Month and um, all the things that, you know, you and I have talked about with Women in Defense. Uh, the first time that I had the opportunity to to meet with, with uh, Janice Clever Jones was when, I think it was 2020, and she brought up the term VUCA, which we thought was going to last for like just another six months. And it turns out that we are still in this VUCA period for, um, it seems like a lifetime now. Um, so thank you for, for joining here today. Thank you. Um, so one moment. All right, did you want me to start, Kay Frey? Yeah, if you could just um, just say a couple of things about um, NDIA, Women in Defense, and, and then I'm going to um, have uh, Ms. Glover Jones also say a couple of things about DIA. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. It's a, a privilege uh, to participate in an event uh, run by an amazing leader and a, an amazing um, champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion, who's my friend, Karen Frey. Um, also, uh, a distinct privilege to share the stage with uh, Janice Glover Jones, who was a keynote speaker at WID's virtual leadership conference in 2020 and has been championing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at DIA for many, many years. Um, I spent 28 and a half years in the Air Force. I'm an intelligence officer by trade. Uh, I'm also uh, a bit of a resourcing nerd because I was a programmer for uh, my last four years. I was the panel chair for the Air Force for Intel and uh, Command and Control. I've been at Women in Defense as the executive director since 2017. Uh, we help uh, women who are already in the national security enterprise uh, do professional development so they can achieve whatever professional objectives they set for themselves. And then we work to attract talented young women to choose national security as their careers. So that's a little bit about me. Over. Thank you so much. Ms. Clover Jones, you could tell me a little about the role of the governor of the DIA. <laughs> sure. Um, so Rachel, good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, I am Janice Clover Jones, as, as, as Karen introduced, and uh, I've been at DIA since um, 1986. And so I've been here a while, and I am now, uh, as, as, as Karen said, the director of mission services. And in this capacity, I basically take care of the, our workforce. And so that is my goal of taking care of the workforce, as well as um, providing uh, mission agility onto um, our core mission. Um, as many of you may know or have heard is, you know, we, the National Defense Strategy told us to pivot to great power competition. And so we're in the midst of, um, of making that pivot uh, across our workforce and looking at great power competition, focusing on, on Russia and China. And so, um, as she said, I do all things um, on human resources where we look at uh, identifying talent to recruiting talent and um, developing the talent once they get on board and actually seeing it all the way through the talent management life cycle. Um, when I look at from a logistics standpoint, we have a global worldwide mission that DIA, uh, that DIA must deliver upon. And so uh, you can't do a global worldwide mission without your logistics. Um, I, I look at um, our Office of the Surgeon General, where we are a big part of um, not just COVID, but that has been you know, a good part of 
75% uh, of what they do, but also from an operational standpoint, um, taking care of our workforce as they travel across the globe and ensuring that we have um, medical operations and plans in place. Um, we look at facilities, DIA uh, workforce is in 147 countries. And so uh, we make sure that we have um, proper facilities for them to perform their mission. And then the other thing that we do is we take a look at um, um, talent development. And so we bring in entry level and our goal is to grow them all the way up to senior executive should they desire to do, but making sure that we have all of the developmental needs and gates in place uh, to do that. So that's kind of uh, what I, I do and then security. Um, so we have um, all things security. As you know, we require a top secret uh, SCI clearance. And so we have physical security, personnel, personal security, and all things in between um, insider threat and things of that nature. So that's all covered in our portfolio. So again, I'll start off with what I said. It's all about taking care of the people and adding value to the mission and being that, uh, you know, that um, enabler that creates um, agility for our core mission here at DIA. Thank you. So when, you know, what you said a couple years ago really resonated with me. And so I want to give a little bit more context to it. You said we were in a VUCA environment and it, it it's a project management term and it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and, ambigu and ambiguity. Ambiguity, just made up a new word. Um, and it describes a constant unpredictable change and it's what we are still in as predictable as we may think it is it's this constant state of unpredictability so it brings me to my first question um as we come out of the pandemic what are leaders doing to attract talent because we're going into a, a new phase um of great resignation. And we have a lot of the workforce talent that is um, retiring. So what are we as leaders doing to retain talent? Uh, where do you think we will struggle? Where do you think we will succeed? Sure, um, so I, I think, um, so specifically what DIA is doing is um, what the, what the, you know, you never, I, I'm of the mindset you never waste a crisis Right, and so what COVID allowed us to do is to implement some virtual hiring tools that we probably would have eventually implemented, but it certainly would not have been as fast as we did that allow us to be able to do um, some virtual interviews and, 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 and looking at hiring um, from a different uh, capacity. We've also expanded some of our partnerships and continuing to develop partnerships um, at uh, colleges and universities, but not only colleges and universities, but at organizations that offer a variety of, of candidates and potential candidates where from a government perspective, we, would, we had not uh, done in the past. And so it allows us to be able to do some targeted recruiting when we look at persons with disability. We're actually uh, instituting where we're looking at um, hiring um, those with um, um, neurodiversity. And so we got uh, two people coming in in the pipeline. And so I think that what we what what are we doing to attract the talent is you know it's really putting our mission out there and exploring different um, avenues that we hadn't done before in the past. When you talk about retention, right, and so bringing them in, and um, bringing them in and get and getting them through the door is one thing. Um, it's yet another of retaining the talent once you got it, and we recognize that. Um, and so one of the things that we are doing and that I'm trying to institute is that people may come in and come in roles because that's where um, formal education or experience may be, but it may not necessarily be their passion. And so what I'm encouraging supervisors and managers to do is to find out what their passion is and then tap into that passion through a variety of, uh, of, of, of programs and projects that we may have. So for example, I had an officer, she was newly hired at DIA. She had not been here 30 days. Um, when the last, uh, I think it was um, um, hurricane hit Haiti, um, they needed Haitian speaking people to go and to deploy there. 
We sent her. I, I, I mean, she probably could just tell you what DIA sent, stood for, but she came, um, but she was a, a Haitian native and she spoke the natural language and she was able to go there and provide support to Southcom and, uh, and, and delivered on the mission within two weeks of her coming to DIA and staying there for another two weeks. Um, in the past, somebody would have said, well, I can't send her. She doesn't have enough experience. No, she had what the skills required for, um, for the mission to be delivered upon. So giving people those opportunities, she was so excited. She said, you know, I heard them say that I could potentially deploy, but I didn't think it would be within the first 30 days. Um, there's another young officer that when I was the chief diversity and inclusion officer, we had recruited her, but she hadn't showed up on board yet. Um, well, now she's here and this officer holds a, a PhD um, from Emory um, Multicultural and Education. And um, she's a uh, diversity and inclusion expert and certified um, as she's working in our diversity and inclusion office. But she also has a passion for teaching and facilitating. And so she is now in the process of being an adjunct professor in our academy um, and our learning and development department. And so that then gives her an opportunity to fulfill her role, but also to tap into her passion. So those are some of the things that we are looking at from a retention standpoint, is making sure that officers, um, they get an opportunity. Um, it, it, are they in the right role? Do their skills align uh, with the jobs that they are performing? When it comes to challenges um, for us, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we, we have to get better at is our hiring timeline. And so we are in the process of going through um, our whole timeline and looking at where are we losing, losing time? Where can we put some better or add um, PKIs, performance indicators that we can begin to measure to increase the speed of hiring um, so that we can remain competitive uh, against others who um, are out there and able to hire at a much quicker rate than we are. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I appreciate that feedback. The timeline on hiring is definitely something that is impacting everybody. Uh, Rachel, I wanted to give you a minute to also jump in on that, um, on what leaders can do to retain, uh, retain talent, because I know you have the opportunity to see it from quite a variety of sides and policy as well. I think attracting and retaining is about the same things. Um, first, it's about culture. So every organization has a different culture and it's really important for individuals when they're deciding where they wanna to work to decide you know, what do they want their life to look like and what kind of culture do they want to be a part of because culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, when I, when I was transitioning out of the Air Force, I interviewed with one of the primes and uh, interview um, uh, was the feedback that I got from, you know, someone I knew from a previous life who, life who was proud of the interview process is that one of the interviewers, because it was a panel, thought that I had talked too much and that I was very uh, aggressive, which I would actually say is more, I'm very, I am very assertive. That is who I am. My Air Force call sign is yak. Like I have never uh, had an opportunity to talk that I haven't been, ooh, I'm in. And so if a, an organization is not looking for that, especially in their women, which they weren't, and if they're not looking for someone assertive who when I see a problem is gonna call it out and look for a solution, then that's not a good fit for me. And so WID spends a lot of time, you know, especially when we're talking to young women, but even when we're talking mid-career women, you know, what, what culture are you gonna be happy in? And I know for myself, uh, a mission focused, mission first, um, NDIA, which is the parent organization of women in defense, the National Defense Industrial Association, warfighters are our number one priority. Ensuring that, uh, that uh, American warfighters and the warfighters of our friends, partners, and allies have all of the capabilities, training, and support they need to enjoy a decisive competitive advantage across the spectrum of conflict, yeah, I'm all in. I'm all in for making sure that uh, we can deter, and if we can't deter, that we win fast and we win with uh, overwhelming strength. So I think culture is the most important. Culture starts with leadership, so making sure that you are and this is hard, so I don't want uh, Ms. Jo Glover Jones to think that I don't think this is hard. You know, identifying good leaders and then making sure you put them in a position where they can be successful and where they can establish a culture that makes everyone in the organization feel like they can contribute based on their talents and their work ethic and their initiative. So leadership, 
And then the way we attract entry level personnel at NDIA is we emphasize, you know, your people who work for me or people who work for Wes Hallman, who's our senior vice president for strategy and policy. We don't expect our entry level people to stay more than two or three years. We expect them to come in. We expect to teach them how to operate within the national security environment. We expect to mentor and advocate for them. And then we expect to give them access to our gigantic network and then help them to take their next job uh, in the national security enterprise and take with it an appreciation for NDIA and what we do um, for our industrial base and for our warfighters to help our uh, reputation continue to grow. And so those are some of the things I think from both an attraction and a retention standpoint that, that really matter when you're talking about talent. Thank you. And so my next question, and, and Rachel, I'll just start with you again. And, and, and Ms. Clever Jones, I'll ask the same question of you. You've made uh, a very timely comment because this is what everyone is addressing right now. And the comment you made to me was, just because we can doesn't mean we should. And it was regarding the working from home policy, hybrid, you know, do, do we just completely shift? Uh, as we reevaluate our approach, what should stay in place look like? How do you think we should adapt? Yep, so I, I wanna start out by um, bringing up something that um, one of the members of my national council brought up, which is when I'm having a, a work from home, work from work kind of conversation that one of the first things that I wanna make sure I emphasize is that it's not a choice for a lot of people who work in national security. Um, if you uh, work in a SCIF, in a TSSEI facility, there's not as much opportunity for you to work at home. If you make things, if you make thermocouples, if you are smelting metal for uh, jet engines um, or, or anything that requires you to actually, you know, you're welding, you, you have to be at work. And so, first of all, I think we need to be careful because some of these discussions can border on the, uh, on it appears privileged. Oh, should I go to work today? Or I could work from home. Like it comes across as privileged. And I think we need to be thoughtful about that when we're, when we're having these discussions. And then uh, the, the second, let's make two more points. The first is, is that I'm not really a work from home kind of person. I'm a dinosaur a little bit. Um, I, I came back to the office in June of 2020 because I am more effective and efficient in the office. And I have an, I have a, an associate director who feels the same way. We get a lot of work done because we work right next to each other and we can just lean back in our chairs and talk to each other and we can collaborate in that way. It also offers me the opportunity to mentor and advocate for her um, because I see what she does every day. She is known as the utility infielder at NDIA, which is a fairly small nonprofit, about 80 people. Um, and, and that is different than the people who chose when they could to work from home for the, you know, the better part of, of, of the last two years. But I've reached the point as we start to emerge from COVID where my job, my team is, is more effective and can better support me as the executive if they're here. And, you know, that you know you get paid as an executive a certain amount of money and so you probably should not be doing administrative tasks but if time sensitive administrative tasks pop up in a day when i'm in the office and there's nobody else here guess what i'm doing um and then that means that i get to work on saturdays and sundays because the the vice president parts of my job don't go away so we have had a lot of conversation here at ndia and you know part of the conversation is is that this job, the membership job, where we support 63,000 individual members and over 1,700 corporate members, you know, requires a certain level of, of cooperation and collaboration that is, that is, I mean, while it's doable electronically, it is, it is not as effective or efficient as we do a quick huddle, we walk around, we talk to the other people in the organization. So, so I'm, not, I'm not convinced um, that it's the best for my team. And then the other part that a, that a friend brought up this morning at a breakfast is um, um, her husband is a director of student affairs at a college or university that's near the, the DC area. And he said that the, that the junior and senior classes there in college don't know how to model good behaviors for the freshmen and sophomores because the juniors and seniors have, have not had they did not have juniors and seniors to kind of show them how it was done at school. And I worry a little bit, and I, another friend talked about when she was a, a lieutenant going into an Air Force organization, she watched the, the female captain in her office. And how did that female captain interact with her peer group? How did she act with her supervisors? And how did she interact with the people she was supervising? And there's a, a, there's a significant amount of, you know, how do things work? How does the office work? How do I 
grow as a professional officer or how do I grow as a professional civilian that is not taught. It's not in a book anywhere. It's not in a checklist. It's interaction between you and the people you, you work with or you work for. And so I, I think there's a lot of this conversation that we haven't quite gotten to the, to the end of. And I, I, I think that this is something we are, we are, we're, we're kind of in the middle of, and we're going to continue to have to work through because I don't know that we necessarily have any good final answers yet. Over. Thank you. So I, you know, I want to ask the same question of you, but I actually want to say it a little bit differently. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. What is your, what is your take on working? For yeah. So there's actually, and, and Rachel kind of hit on it, there's actually a legal aspect of it, right? And um, when you work for national security, um, there is a requirement that you maintain a top secret SCI clearance. Um, and, and so by default, there's not roles in any of the, um, um, well, I'm gonna talk about DIA. There's not a roles in DIA where you can do 100% of your duties in an unclass environment. Um, if that was the case, you would need a clearance. And so um, when COVID was at its worst, we were able to do um, some things at home, um, but uh, we also, um, there were things that other people couldn't do at home that beyond taking training, um, beyond taking development, right? Uh, uh, looking for things where they could continue to develop and to grow. And so there is a legal aspect of it that if you're going to um, maintain a employment here, you have to maintain your clearance. And so by default, that means that there are certain things that have to be done in a SCIF environment. And so we have telework policy, but our policy um, right now states that even if you're on a temporary telework agreement, you have to come in uh, two days, uh, I think it's two days uh, uh, biweekly um, within a pay period. You have to come in two days within a pay period. And so that's where we are. And like I said, um, are there some things that you can do? But you also have to look at it. Our environments are not built, uh, at least uh, for DIA, uh, our unclass environments are not built where you have access to the same tools and the same data that you would have when you come into a SCIF facility as well. And so those are things that you need to think about. Okay, so in line with this questioning, David asked a question here of uh, Food for Thought, you know, what if your team could pop into a WeWork type of space um, 10 minutes from your house um, you know, or, and it, I guess, David, you're meaning like that could be secure. And then the other second thing is, you know, what if SCIFs were available throughout major defense regions? Um, and I'm guessing that also has to say, you know, you'd, you could also ask the question, um, you know, are, are all the systems going to be um, on the same level? And then what if we figure out how to model good behavior in a virtual world? And I love that one. And I wish for that one so much. Yeah, so um, we do allow telework at our different facilities that might not be your primary location or where your, your team is that you can. Um, so we do have spaces dedic dedicated um, throughout our facilities where you can go in and register and um, work out at a telework facility, a telework location um, for a, a, a different um, uh, different location for a temporary time uh, time frame if your supervisor approves of it. Um, with regard to uh, modeling good behavior, you know, one of the things that I was concerned about is when COVID uh, came and we had to uh, send everybody home um, for, you know, obvious reasons, one of the things became quite clear was, you know, we told supervisors, go home, check in on your team, make sure your team is taken care of, and some organizations had put telework plans in place, go to these sites, take some training, watch these um, webinars or things of that nature. But here's the reality. We had never trained um, employees or supervisors to actually manage and lead in a telework environment. We hadn't given them the tools and the capability. Um, I was coming on the heels. I had just returned back from um, a joint duty assignment where I actually had an opportunity 
to work in private industry for a year. And I did, um, I did, uh, I worked for Dell. Well, I had become accustomed to remote working because that's primarily what Dell Technologies did. So when I wasn't, when I wasn't traveling, I was um, working remotely. Um, but for people, and uh, to Rachel's point, everybody is not effective um, working remotely. Um, and we cannot assume that everybody's home life is conducent to where they had private space where they can, you know, stand up an office and create an office. Um, that it that and so you have to factor all of that in, and you have to actually give people the school, the tools, and the technology to be successful and to model those behaviors. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but are you when people come? start coming back in the office, um, some people have to relearn how to work together with people in a, in a physical location, because now you've developed new, new habits, new behaviors that's not necessarily conducive to a team environment. Over. That, that is absolutely true. Um, I used to lead a distributed team and our entire concept uh, of going to work uh, included a road warrior type of mentality. So it came with some sacrifices because it meant that you were gone from home at least five or six weeks um, for, you know, it, in one block of time uh, and your home time was at, you know, was minimum. So, you know, it's, uh, we were set up for that and going back to a regular workforce time where you're working an eight to five, um, that was something to, uh, to get accustomed to. So I want to ask another question and it's about mentorship. So I had um, the absolute honor to meet Sergeant at Arms Karen Gibson at, at an event hosted by NEC. And she spoke about having a professional mentor and it's really given me a lot to consider. Can you do you, uh, dive deeper into the process of finding your mentors, what you've done and your own personal experiences and how this continues to help you? Um, sure. You you want me to answer that? First? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Yeah. So on this was observe people because I think for, for me what was important is if you're going to get a mentor it really needs to be somebody that you can trust it needs to be somebody that you can build a relationship um, but it also needs to be someone that you're willing to give back in that relationship so it shouldn't be a one-way relationship where you're just constantly seeking advice but it should be two-way that you can give back and so for me um, I made sure that I had a diverse uh, group of mentors so I had a mentor that was um, familiar with the organization, um, who knew uh, the inside and out of the organization, much senior than me. And then I had another mentor that um, didn't know so much about our organization, um, and 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 um, but was familiar with the intelligence community. Um, and then I had a third mentor, and the third mentor had nothing to do with the federal government, had nothing to do with DOD, had nothing to do with the intelligence community. Um, and so I, I used those three and, and one of them didn't look like me and I made sure that they didn't look like me. Um, and, and then I had formal mentor relationships and then I had informal mentor relationships where I observed, I watched how people conducted themselves in meetings. I watched how people uh, handled difficult situations. And if it was something that I was intrigued about, um, I would reach out to them and say, hey, I, I observed you in, in doing this. I'd like to know, is that something you could teach me? I want to be able to do that, um, to navigate those tough ch uh, challenges on the spot. And, and, and that's how it is, right? And so it's, and what I encourage people to do is get a diverse set of, of, of mentors to have informal and formal mentor relationships, but then eventually um, grow into where you're actually getting coaching instead of mentoring, um, because you don't wanna become totally dependent on someone helping you navigate a minefield or someone helping you um, navigate an obstacle, because what if you can't get in touch with that person at that particular time, right? So you need to be able to think through it um, and deal with it uh, at, at speed and, and and do that. And that's what I think coaching offers you, over. Yeah, I, I never thought about also giving back to the mentor. I, I always looked at it as I go to that mentor, they're here 
for me, giving back is, uh, is, is something new. So um, someone I consider a mentor is also on this call. So Rachel, um, same question. Yeah, so I, I look at it um, a little bit differently. I think in my Air Force career, um, especially at, at when I was more junior, I didn't really have, I don't, I'm not even sure I knew what a mentor was or why you needed one or anything. The Air Force uh, career path is pretty much laid out and straightforward for an intelligence officer who wants to compete for squadron command and, um, and school and group command and the, the things that get you promoted to 06 when you retire. So, um, so sometimes you need a mentor. Like, I don't know, I don't know how civilians figure out, you know, what path should you take? Because there's not, it's not as straightforward as it is when you're wearing a uniform. When you're wearing a uniform, there are, you know that there are certain jobs that if you take them, they're going to make you more competitive for the next rank. And you know, there are some jobs that if you take them, you're going to have a blast. It is not going to make you more competitive for the next rank. There are some that where it's a little bit in the gray area, but for the most part, you know, when you take a job, whether it's valued by your service and the services are all kind of giant bureaucracy. So um, what I did was I talked to my peers. I had a lot of peer mentoring and I think peer mentoring is really important and peer mentoring in the military is essentially build yourself a good network. Um, I was the ISR division chief for NATO's operation in Libya. And you, you guys may, may or may not know this, but Congress never declared Libya a conflict. So in terms of getting resources, for the Libyan conflict, I was dependent on the bro network. And the bro network is made up of both men and women and you know, all over the Air Force, but who, who has a, a captain they can put on orders for a couple of months to come help me, you know, because of the 28 nations in NATO, only five of them have career intelligence uh, professionals. So we had people building uh, uh, the ISR part of ATOs who didn't really understand ISR and none of, none of them have targeting, none of them have targeting. Ugh. Anyway, so you need a good uh, a peer network. And then I was very fortunate in my career that as I got more senior, what I, what I had from my supervisors was not mentoring so much as advocacy, as leaders who would advocate for me to go to Army War College and a leader who advocated for me to get a job at Air Combat Command that got me to um, Squadron Command. Um, and that was really important, you know, that if you work hard and you're talented, you want your supervisor to be more than a mentor. You want your supervisor to be someone who advocates for you to get uh, additional opportunities. And kind of the last point that I would make, because I think uh, Ms. Glover Jones pointed out, and I think it's really important, is this idea of work within uh, any kind of mentoring or advocacy relationship. Well, the work that you do in your position in order to demonstrate your potential for positions of greater responsibility, and the work that you do uh, Leanne Perrette, the president of Boeing Defense Space and Security, said in a in a WIT event that you know people would get a, a a meeting with her, a mentoring session with Leanne Perrette, and they just automatically expected that they were going to get promoted because they had a chance to talk to the leader of the organization, and that is not a thing. Um, what she expected was that they would come in and they would have some specific questions about things that they could do to make themselves, you know, more more ready for the next opportunity that might come along, that might make them more ready to be a senior leader within Boeing. But just getting a meeting with the senior leader does not mean you've automatically made it. You need to go into that meeting with a very specific set of questions, maybe a very specific ask. And, a, and then when they tell you what it is you need to do, you have to be willing to do the work. So I'm yeah, going to stay with you. Karen, I, I, would, I would like to add um, um, on to that. And so Please. as a civilian, like I said, I, I started in DIA in January of 1986. Um, when I came into DIA, uh, I was, when I applied to DIA, I was a GS-1 and they offered me a GS-3. Um, I've navigated my, uh, my career from um, a GS-1 um, up to where I am today, um, a, a senior executive tier three level. With that in mind, yes, for civilians, it's not as cut and dry as military, but this is where it was critical for, um, for me to have mentors and, and even peer mentors. But it, it also was, you had to, I tell people, it's almost like um, eating bone fish, right? You eat the meat and you throw the bones away. Because I remember one time, um, DIA had a program for um, full-time study where you were able to apply to go to school uh, for full-time for two full semesters, keep your job, earn your leave and everything, but they paid you to go to school and they paid your tuition. 
Um, I remember sitting at the lunch table talking to my peers and I said, I think I'm going to apply for this program. And um, at that time, I was in an administrative job and they said, you know, don't waste your time applying for that program because they don't give it to people who are in administrative jobs um, and they don't give it to minorities. And I thought about it, um, but I said, well, none of those people at the table was in a decision making position to be able to tell me no. And so I'm actually going to put my application in and let those who are in a decision making position to be able to tell me yes or to tell me no. I put my application in and I actually got the opportunity to go on to full time study and I did two full semesters. So I say that to say that even with any mentoring relationship, whether um, it is someone that you trust, you also have to trust your gut and your instinct and follow your instinct um, and to to navigate around and to be able to ultimately make the best decision um, for you in your career and your family at that time. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great advice. So I want to ask you about uh, leadership. So every, every individual on a team is going to come with a different background, different professional mindset and experience. And while some people may employ and even enhance what they may employ and enhance, some people might rebel against and they might even seek to dismantle it. So when you're leading an organization, where do you create your line of consistency and equity and fairness when you are diligently trying to get the job done? And Rachel, I'll start with you. Yeah, I don't know about you, Ms. Glover Jones, but my mother used to tell me that life's not fair. And so I think there, um, there are certain things that you can do to, to try to give people as much opportunity as possible but it's never gonna be completely fair or equitable across the board. And um, both in, when I was wearing the uniform and, and, this, and in this position, what helps me is you know, what, what is best for the mission? What is best for the warfighter? What's, what's going to get the job done? And then give people opportunities to excel or not excel, give them feedback, talk to them. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. One of the things that we didn't talk about on the work from home versus work from work is I will tell you that as a, as a leader, myself personally, I find it a lot harder to critique people over Zoom or over email than I do in person. And so if I see something that one of the people who works for me does and it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's a bad approach or it's bad etiquette or something like that, I am less likely to send them an email to say, hey, this is, this this is, this is a bad idea um, than I would be if I were in the office and could walk over and have a conversation where they can see my body language and where I can look at them and see, do they really understand not just what I'm saying, but why I'm saying it? Because if I'm criticizing someone, it's because I'm trying to make them better. I'm trying to make sure that they are more, more, uh, more ready, more people, more, more qualified to do the mission, because in the end, that's what, that's what this is all about. So I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure that I've ever worried about being fair, ex except in the sense that, you know, there are standards, there were Air Force standards, we, you know, apply, like if you passed, if you failed your PT test, then you got marked down on your performance appraisal, because you didn't pass your PT test, you know, if you were supposed to finish certain um, education or training at a particular grade level, and you didn't finish it, well, that's a standard that, that you didn't meet, you know, standards really help. Um, giving people, giving everybody as much opportunity as you possibly can. And then if you're not giving them op an opportunity to explain to them why and give them a chance to, to get back up there. But I don't know that I worry a, a great deal about, you know, is it fair? Because I, I just inherently don't think that you, that fair is achievable, especially, you know, in life. Over. So, so um, Karen, there was a, uh... There was a time I was um, I was at my desk and I was working late. It was about between hours of uh, six and six thirty. And my supervisor, my division chief at the time, he was still there and he heard me. Um, so he walked over and he said, "Hey, why are you still here?" And um, I told him why I was there. That I was working on a project. Um, that actually it was a team project that we were supposed to be working on, but one of the team members did not uh, do their particular responsibility. 
And um, I began to lament and complain about this um, team member's performance or lack thereof um, to my supervisor. And so my supervisor asked me, uh, he asked me a question. He said, um, how did you set this team member up for success? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, um, did you give them something that was uh, played on their strengths or did you give them something that played on their weakness? And if you gave them a responsibility that, uh, that they were weak in, did you give them the tools necessary for them to be successful? So I had to think about that. And I said, you know, I'm not sure. Um, and I went home that night, I thought about what he said. And um, the next day I actually went and had a conversation with this team member and I said, hey, I stayed here late last night because we had this tasker, due date is approaching. And I noticed that you did not um, complete your part of, of, of the responsibility. Um, and I said, you know, one of the things that, um, what could I have do have done to make this easier for you or better? And it was then that he told me that he had never done that role before. He had never been trained in it. He didn't do it. He didn't know how to come and talk to me. And more importantly, I didn't go to him before I assigned the responsibility. So one of the things that that taught me was uh, to be more engaging and don't make assumptions and don't think that people um, will automatically figure it out. There are some team members that you have that can be assertive and they can take it as a challenge that if you give them something, they're not sure that they have a network or they're going to do the research and they will get it done. But as the leader of an organization, it is my responsibility to make sure that people understand um, what their roles and responsibilities are and what can I do to ensure that they have the tools and the capabilities to be able to deliver on those. And so I do believe that um, you can be a, a fair, and when I, when I say fair is I consistently show up the same way all the time. I consistently treat people um, the same way all the time. And when I come into any organization, I share with them what my personal leadership philosophy is. I share with them with my, what my core values are and how they show up in my leadership style. And I share with them um, my communication style and then what my non-negotiables are as a leader. And, and, and here's how you could expect me to be able to show up. And so I think over the years that that's what I have learned. And so I, I look at um, fairness, I look at um, um, the ability to meet people where they are. And I use this illustration to say, you know, it's nice if everybody has a pair of shoes, but it's even better if I give you the shoe that actually fits your foot and I don't buy all size seven shoes when everybody on the team is not a size seven, right? That I actually get you a shoe that you can fit. And so that's the approach that I take. Um, sometimes I get it right and other times I don't, that some people are just not a good fit. And it's okay to recognize that. And it's okay to say, okay, let me help you um, move on and it's not personal. Um, and so we can figure things out and we can work together because you will just actually be a better fit on another team. Over. That, that leans so strongly on the emotional intelligence background. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's something that not everyone brings to the table and it takes a lot of work. Um, so I, I appreciate that. So there's, there's a question in here and, um, and I, I feel that a lot of people may resemble this comment. Um, so I, I wanna ask it because we are in the same frame of this right now that we're talking about. One of the issues that has been identified as part of the great resignation is that the people in the box don't feel like they are getting coaching and opportunities that their in-office counterparts are getting. How do we overcome the trepidation to not engage with the people working in quote unquote the box from Marcy? So I will say um, it is easier, uh, you know, if, I, if, if I'm in the office and I'm walking down the hallway and I see, you know, Justin or I see Spencer, it's easy to stop and say, hey, Justin or Spencer, have you heard about um, this, that, and the other? For the standpoint of those who may be working remotely, you just have to be extra intentional. And so one of the things that, and I say it goes on both sides, right? As the leader who has a team that may have not fully integrated back into the office, 
I would say, uh, you know, schedule some, it doesn't have to be long, five, 10 minute check-ins. One of the things I used to do was just ping my people and say, hey, thinking about you, uh, uh, how, how, how are you doing? Is there anything going on? Um, you can send them a jabber. You don't even have to talk to them, right? You know, call them, but you can send them a jabber and, and say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I did this today with someone who doesn't even work for me anymore. Um, that person was on my mind. I picked up the Tamburg, I, I called, and I only had five minutes before my next meeting was going to start. Um, when they answered, I said, hey, I don't want to, I said, I'm calling you because you was on my mind. I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. I got five minutes before I have to be at another meeting. Um, and we had a quick, you know, two minute phone conversation and, and, and that was it. Um, and I said, hey, reach out if you need something um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk at a deeper level um, and uh, at, a, at a different time. And so you just have to be intentional. I would say to the person who, um, uh, the trepidation, get on your supervisor's schedule. If you're not in the office, get on their schedule. Um, what Rachel said was, you know, have some questions, um, have an ask already defined um, and say, hey, I like to get on your schedule because I would like to get your perspective on the following as I navigate through X, Y, and Z, whatever the situation may be. So be specific, be prepared, get on their calendar. Um, if they continue to, uh, if the meeting continues to get pushed, then that's okay. That's not the only person that you can talk to. Over. Thank you. And Rachel, did you have any feedback on this? Um, I, I uh, appreciate what Mr. Glover Jones said about have a, a specific ask. Um, I I think that there are parts of not being in the office, like a, it's probably a spectrum, much like everything else. Like if you're in the office a couple of days a week, you're going to have some of those informal opportunities. You see someone in the hallway, hey, how's it going? You know, what what problems are you running into? Oh, that thing that we got to do in two weeks. You know, give me a quick you know, 30 second update on where we are or where any barriers are that I might be able to knock down for you. Um, if you're not in the office at all, you're never gonna have that opportunity. And if you're in the office more, we do a, a thing most Thursday afternoons here at NDIA um, called something in policy, um, uh, adult beverage of your choice in policy. And um, it's a place where the, the people who work the national security stuff at NDIA and sometimes our meeting planners sit down and, and we talk about everything like last week's question was Supreme Court justices. Do we pick the person who the lawyers all think is the most gifted among them intellectually or is there an imperative to have a Supreme Court that represents um, you know, the diversity of the United States go? And then it becomes a big conversation. We're a national security organization. So having these types of conversations, one for the young people who are here, it sharpens their debate skills it forces them to defend what they think. It forces the, the dinosaurs to question our assumptions when we hear the young people come with uh, perspectives that are different than ours. But that is a thing that we do for an hour every Thursday because we're all in the office. And we tried to do it you know, um, uh, during COVID via the, via the Zoom. And it doesn't work as well because only one person can talk at a time. You don't it is really hard to have the kind of give and take that even Ms. Glover Jones and I would have if we were sitting on a stage together with Karen at a podium, that you know, a conversation as opposed to Ms. Glover Jones talks and then I talk. And so, you know, when you don't have those opportunities, I think that it does get really hard. And I don't know how you how you can replicate that. I do think, as Ms. Glover Jones said, have an ask and 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 I would, you know, offer three things that could be your potential ask. Um, what do I need to do? And let me be very specific. It's what do I need to do to get promoted, to get a raise? And in the Air Force, it's to earn the number one stratification on my officer performance report. I told every officer who ever worked for me, you know, because we would do initial feedback and then we would do midterm feedback and then it would be feedback when, when we did their performance appraisal. Not, not a single one ever asked me the first time they came in, you know, what do I need to do to earn your number one strat? Like, why would you not force me to go on record about the tangible things that you would need to do in order to be the number one stratification to give yourself the best opportunity for promotion? 
Why are, why are you not asking your boss to put on the record what things do you need to do to make yourself most competitive for promotion or most competitive for a race? People seem sometimes afraid to ask those questions. And to me, that's a really good specific ask. And if your boss hasn't thought about it, the tangible things that they're expecting, they'll bet on your boss because then they're just kind of, then there's probably a lot of bias in their process when they're making the decision because they're making it on their gut. Um, and Maybe they don't have the answer the first time, but maybe then they say, give me a week or two to put my thoughts down on paper and then we'll have a re-attack. And, and that will honestly help them, Chris, this is the mentoring, you know, giving back. It'll crystallize their thoughts and then they'll have a structure around which they can make less biased decisions for the entire organization. Thank you. So I have one last question happy to forego the last question and uh, open the floor to questions from anyone else who wants to jump in. We have just a little time left. Otherwise, I just wanted to other... say, I just wanted to say thanks for your time and thoughts. It's interesting to hear different perspectives on this, um, especially from with a lot of leadership experience. So thank you. Yeah, for the woman who's the female founder and inventor, the, um, uh, I will tell you that uh, gaining access to the defense community is hard. It, it, is, it is hard. You need to ask a lot of questions. The websites are not easy. It is a thing that NDIA and women in defense, you know, it's a, it's a question that we get a lot of the time, and there is no, honestly, there's no magic answer. There's no simple answer. It, and, you know, getting into the defense space, there's, depending on what kind of business you are and who, who you want to work with, you know, do you want to try and be a prime on a contract yourself? Do you want to partner with someone else? Like the answers are very different depending on the type of business you are and what you're looking for in order to, to, to do what you want to do. One recommendation that I have is as things start to go back to in-person, is find some in-person events where you know there are going to be other small businesses there and then talk to those small businesses who are normally going to be either they're going to be the owners or, or you know someone very high up in the organization and start to have some conversations with them and they can start to give you maybe some suggestions once they have a better idea of where you are and and uh, and where and what you might want to accomplish within the defense space but it's not easy um i, I would like to add to that um I'm not 100% certain, but I think you can touch at least with um, DIA, NGA. I think the combat support agencies, small business offices have mentor programs where they actually hook you up with another small business that will actually serve as a mentor. I don't know all the details of it, but I encourage you to start doing some research on each one of the um, combat support agencies, small business um, programs, and seeing what's out there from an avail uh, from a mentorship and training and development, so that you can help um, um, get those relationships uh, that Rachel was talking about. Over. All right. Well, we are exactly at time. I cannot thank you uh, enough for um, making time for this. Rachel McCaffrey with NDIA and Women in Defense and Janice Glover-Jones with DIA. Thank you both so much for your time. I truly, truly appreciate it.